Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Flames have probably finished their busiest stretch of the season, their busiest stretch in a long time, as they complete nine games in 14 days with four big wins at the end. As always, I'm Dan, and once again, welcome back, Matt. Matt's here joining me. Hi, everybody. Uh, Back after the week off, and looking forward to recapping some all right games. We we sat Matt out last week because I was trying to make a deal, but we couldn't get it done, so we had to put him back in the lineup. Yep. I was trying to trade you an Oilers podcast, but all they offered me was an expired Tim's card, so I said no deal. They didn't even throw in the or- old Dutch chips? Like, come on. Not even, a, I, I was even asking for a stale vanilla dip donut. Uh, Wouldn't even give me that, so. <laughs> so, I, I had to bring you back, man. Yep. Well, uh, Calgary Flames finished off their longest road trip of the season. We had four games since we talked last, and... Um, you weren't here last week to as we had uh, Kevin and Mike filling in for you, but you can catch you can catch the back end of this road trip. Yeah, the Flames went into the Jack Eichelis Sabers, and it wouldn't have mattered if Eichel was there or not. Still a big win for the Flames. Johnny Goudreau, Andrew Mangiapane, Matthew Kachuk, Andrew Mangiapane again, and Johnny Goudreau again all score in this game to make it five nothing for the Flames. Yeah, um, this was basically Calgary saying thanks for nothing in the Eichel deal and just absolutely demolished the Buffalo Sabres. You know, the the thing I saw on Twitter is Eichel wouldn't have been in the lineup anyways, but if he could have added another hat trick to that. Yeah. I mean, he's still out hurt, but that's kind of the game you want is go back in their barn and have him light them up as well. Yeah. Well, Calgary did a very good job and... Yeah, you know, it's one of those games where like this team needs to be able to go against bad teams like the Buffalo Sabres and just execute their game and not play down to the level of their opponent. And that's, like been, they have. A, that's been an issue for years. Yeah, and like Calgary is better than this team, quite clearly. So let's just walk all over them, get your 5 nothing win, and carry on. Let's do just that. I don't think there's much else to say about this game. Let's just carry on. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, the less said about Buffalo and how bad they are, the, the better. <laughs> the Calgary Flames uh, are the visitors for the first ever game in the Islanders' new arena, and they spoil that first win. That'll probably be something they'll be putting a plaque in the uh, concourse at some point. Calgary beats us for our first win in our new rink. Calgary wins 5-2 in this one against the Islanders. Uh, goals from Brad Richardson, Mangiapane, Mangiapane again, and Goudreau. Uh, for, and Trevor Lewis as well gets his first Flames goal in this one. Um, I, You know, something's going on with the Islanders here. I don't think you can say this is all Islanders that's the issue, but I think that the Islanders look less impressive than I expected them to. Well, uh, just uh, first things first, uh, I want to say that the new building for the Islanders looks amazing and reminds me a lot of camden yards in uh baltimore for the baltimore orioles and How so? just the uh just the old-timey brick feeling to it and it just uh seems like a very old style of building yet with modern touches and it just style wise i i really liked the exterior of the building. Well, enjoy those pictures because the renderings of our new one, it's all aluminum and glass and nothing nothing like that. Yeah, I know. But anyhow, um, yeah, the Islanders, to be fair to them, like they started the year with 13 games on the road. And like I don't really think there's any team that can start with that many road games and be clicking at full tilt. That's true. And so their struggles to the beginning of the year, it makes perfect sense. They're still as pretty much as good as they were when they went to the conference finals last year. And you even saw that with flourishes in the game. They were missing several of their players due to COVID. And they did give the Flames a good test, and even though they weren't as good as they probably could have been. You're right. Uh, not looking as good as they did last year for sure. Those 13 games probably definitely have something to do with that, but a more formidable opponent 
or foe than we saw with the Buffalo Sabres. Well, honestly, you know, other than the Coyotes, I think any team would look better than the Sabres did. But What about the Chinese men's team? Well, you know, um, maybe. <laughs> it might not even be in the Olympics, but that's another story for another time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it was... I think it was still good to see the Flames, you know, getting up as much as they did in this one. And you're right. I think the Islanders had some push to them. Um, well, especially just... in the third period. Like, the Islanders were kind of relentlessly trying to get back in the game. It's they just... were looking a little too desperate, though. Which, that, you know, if you're trailing... I mean, they trailing, were, but... You know, if you're trailing, like, you want to see that level of desperation. We've seen the Flames play like it's that true. a number of times, and... If it's successful, then hey, awesome. But it didn't, and we got two empty net goals in that game. So, yeah, it worked out to our advantage. And in the last game of this long road trip that the Flames went on, uh, and the last of their Eastern Conference opponents for this one, Calgary went into Boston. This is a game I was a little bit worried about, um, sending the Flames into Boston and, and what that might look like. The Bruins have always been a pretty good team. We put Dan Vlader in, or Dan Vladder, Vladar, um, who is former Boston prospect, and he gets his first NHL shutout, which is also second. Le- is second. it a second? Okay. Yeah. So his first flame shutout. Um, second. Was, uh... <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. Back to back shutouts. He got one against Ottawa last week. You're right. Yeah. Not back to back, but back to back for him. Yeah. Two games they played. Yeah. Um, and this is also a league leading seven shutouts for the Flames. Yeah. So seven you have shutouts to go in twenty all the way games back is pretty to... impressive. 1928-29 uh, with the Montreal Canadiens uh, who had 22 shutouts in 44 games that year. But mind you, that was the last season before the forward pass was allowed. So, you know, it was kind of a little bit of a different game. <laughs> well, and like you said, they got they got shutouts in about half their games there. Like, that's crazy. Can you imagine if a team got shutouts in half their games now? Well, it depends. You know, if you're talking like the Buffalo Sabres, their opponents will definitely. <laughs> but it's different opponents, not the same six teams over and over. Oh, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's crazy to think of. So, yeah, uh, his second shutout as the Flames, second shutout of the season, and legally in seven shutouts here as the Flames route the Boston Bruins for nothing. Goals from Goudreau, Hannafin's first of the year, Mongepani, and Mikel Backlund. Yeah. The craziest stat that I heard after that game was that uh, the modern day record for most shutouts in a season is actually only 15, and so through 19 games, the Flames are almost halfway there. We're quarter of the way there, it's quarter way through the season and halfway there. So, and watch now for the remaining 62 games, the Flames will get zero shutouts, just because. Probably. Um, well, I don't know. Who we do we have? We don't have Buffalo anymore. Uh, we, many, I think we have one against them. But, how many yeah. more games do we have against Montreal, Seattle, Arizona? That'll be how many shutouts we have left. Yep. <laughs> um, but you know, good to see the backup getting that shutout. I mean, you know, we weren't sure what to expect of Vladar when he came in this year, um, and I think you know, for two shutouts this year. He's looked good in all the games, not just the shutouts. Um, I, I'm really impressed by what we're seeing so far. Well, if you look in the NHL for goalie stats uh, across the entire league, um, Jacob Markstrom, uh, Jack Campbell, and Daniel Vladar are the three best goalies in the league. Yeah. So, you know, it, when two of them are your goalies, hey, that's pretty freaking awesome. And and it really lets you roll those uh you know, really roll those goaltenders a little bit better when you have both guys going and confidence in both. Well, one of the knocks on Vladar was that he would lose his net a little too much, and, you know, like, that was, like, his main knock. But since he's been with the Flames, I haven't really seen that too much. No, me neither. So, you know, and he looks very composed, which... Awesome. (laughs) You know, we'll have to see. (laughs) And hopefully that continues, because... You know, he definitely looks like a starting goalie in the NHL, even if it's, you know, only a few games. You know, it really makes you wonder if they can keep this up, if the duo might be uh, eligible for the Jennings Trophy this year. Oh, guaranteed. And I would be, I would not be surprised if we end up seeing the Vesna going to 
um, Markstrom at the end of the year. I don't think Calgary's ever had a tandem win the uh, the Jennings Trophy. No, the last time I recall it, a tandem winning the Jennings was uh, Rajan Lemelin and uh, other uh, Andy Moog, I think, with Boston back in like the early '90s. So let's see. Um, no, it was uh, one. It looks like by. I'm just looking here on Wikipedia. Um, 2020-2021, Andre Fleury and Mark uh, Robin Leonard both won it. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the year before, Rask and Halak won it. The year before that, it was Greece and Leonard. So you 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 have a you've forgotten a whole chunk of time here. Yeah. But that's okay. I wouldn't have remembered a lot of those tandems either. Yeah. So the for those that don't know, the Jennings Trophy is the award given to the goalkeeper or goalkeeping tandem who've played a minimum 25 goals for the team with the fewest goals against based on regular season play. Yeah. Well, that's where, yeah. I was not, because uh, I'm, how would you say, I'm used to goalies playing more than 55 games. So, you know, it does make sense that those three teams had. Those are kind of the teams that have had 1A, 1B for the last couple of years. Yeah, exactly. And been successful at it. Maybe this year you'll see uh, Koskinen and Skinner win the opposite of the Jennings Trophy, whatever that is. Yeah. What's Jennings backwards? The trophy for the two goalies who play, they get the most goals against. Yeah, the Oilers, yeah. I, I'm not even going to go there. They're kind of... Like, with despite all their improvements this off season, like they're still a two person team, and mm-hmm. you know it's just you know like if they get any injuries to either of those players, like they're gonna just fall in the standings like a rock. Yeah, I agree. Going back to this Boston game, though, I heard from a lot of people online. And I don't know what you think, but I think maybe we've seen it because we're close to this team. But I heard from a lot of the pundits if you will especially those that cover the east that this is really the game when they knew or they thought that the flames had made it like this was the game for them that wow they beat boston for nothing there's a team to be reckoned with well uh, there are always benchmark games and like boston pretty much always has had a legacy of being a really tough team to beat and like even if you do manage to eke out a win like, it's usually a very hard-fought, you know, like a 3-2 win or, you know, a shootout win or some such. But the Flames came in, and they absolutely pasted the Bruins. Like, you, you, you thought that they were the Buffalo Sabres. Like, <laughs> not quite that bad, but you know what I mean. Like, the, it was, the Flames were in control all game. Boston did not have a ton of chances throughout. Johnny Gondreau nailed a guy. Like, just everything was going Calgary's way. It was, and it was the next game, too. The Flames were back home on the 23rd uh, yesterday when we record this, and they played against the uh, the Chicago Blackhawks coming into Calgary to start our homestand, a short homestand here. The Flames now get three days off after this one, and the Flames won 5-2. Dubé, Lucic, Kachuk, Lewis, and Goudreau were the scorers here for the Flames. And this one went pretty much how I expected. I think Chicago's a tough place to play, probably a team with – not a lot of great morale right now, and I was expecting a Flames win for this one. Yeah, um, this was actually, to me, one of the most interesting games to get the psychological part of the Flames team and what they were about. Because they gave up two really bad goals in this game. And, like, they were kind of just defensive laps on the first one and Markstrom making a really good pass to the guy out in front for the Blackhawks mm-hmm. to score. Normally, like, that even though the... It. Yeah, like, normally this team... One of those team, go- goals would have been it for this team. Yeah, and the mental fragility, it's like, oh, something screwed up and we're going to lose. And instead, the Flames just kept at it. They got the second goal after the first Chicago goal when Lucic scored, and they just kept at it. And then when it got to the second intermission, the Flames just turned on the afterburners and just r- ran right over the Blackhawks in the third period until eventually they scored, and then the two empty netters. And 
that that to me was a pivotal game for the Flames because of the fact that like it being the first game back after a long road trip, nine games in fifteen days. You know, you started in Calgary, you went all through the Eastern Seaboard, and you came back. You're dead tired. You're playing a rested opponent. Like all of you're the in things. You're a different time zone. Quite a different time zone. Yeah, like all of the things are stacked up to make you not win this game under normal circumstances from years gone by. And yet they actually managed to not only persevere, but put the accelerator on the gas and just run over the Blackhawks. And I think that is a huge thing for this team moving forward because they don't have that internal quit this season. Yep. And that, yeah, that's... And, and even some of those uh, odds stacked against them, like you were saying, I would say the same thing in Boston. Like, it's the back-to-back, the last game of a road trip, and they didn't have that quit in them either. Yeah, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're, we're playing again? Okay, sure. Now, on those bad goals, I did think that after the Hagel goal for maybe a couple shifts there, we saw the Flames start to lose a little bit of momentum. It felt like they were starting to kind of maybe feel a little bit down on themselves, but they snapped out of it quickly and kept going. Yeah, I mean, and the Hagel goal was at eight fifty seven, and Lucic scored by thirteen oh six, and by that point they were back in it. Yeah, well, I think that um, it very much was uh, an instance where this is the difference between having an NHL coach and having a great NHL coach, and I think Daryl was able to get the guys to calm down on the bench after the goal and like even though they were running around a bit afterwards got them to start playing their game again and you know like it, the difference between just the coaching has been remarkable um it has, hasn't it? yeah and like that that to me frankly like if the flames had generic coach in i think we're probably below 500 at this point if we had just you know insert miscellaneous average nhl coach and i think a lot of the change with this season and us being the best team in the west heading into the u.s thanksgiving is squarely in the lap of daryl sutter yeah i think you're probably right and there's the guys in the top 20 all-time nhl coaches two stanley cups uh 1335 games coached 661 wins and 485 losses. So a guy who knows what it takes to win. Yeah, and he gets the, he has managed to get this team to play the right way. And, you know, uh, there are virtually zero things, frankly, for the anybody to complain about with how the Flames are playing other than, like, oh, maybe you'd like Kachuk to have a little bit more offense or Monaghan to have a little bit more offense. But I can't think of a team where you've ever not had a complaint. No, but, like, if you're splitting hairs to that extent, like, it's like, uh, yeah, um, we're really having to parse <laughs> deep into the reeds here to find something to, you know. Like, the even fl- the third pairing with Zadorov and Good Branson has been amazing. And so. our finish to the week really says that, too, right? If we, Like you said, everyone's, everyone's doing their part. They're maybe not all clicking as much as they need to, but everyone's doing their part. And how often, Matt, have we said this team needs more depth help? And we're getting it this year. I mean, the fact we're seeing even Lewis scoring. Yeah, and Richardson added a couple mm-hmm. goals. And, you know, we're getting positive contributions. Like, Monaghan has not had as much offense thus far this year, but his defensive game... And, like, how much he's in to the games has markedly improved. When you're saying he's not doing as well offensively, he's also a third line, third and fourth line center for most this year. Oh, true. Uh, but, you know, like, it, uh, expectations of him being, like, a 20, 30 goal scorer type, you know, still linger with him. And so, like, tough, those tough numbers... Tough to do, though, when you're paired with some of those guys. No, but his... Um, Willingness to learn how to play defense effectively and emerge, frankly, as a good two-way forward has been remarkable. And, frankly, you can say the th- same thing with the Gaudreau line, who have yet to give up a 5-on-5 goal against. 
Exactly. And and that now puts the Flames tied for first in the league at this point. We're number one in the West, tied for first in the league with 29 points after 20 games. That's a record of 12 wins, three losses, five overtime losses for 29 total points. And that's a uh, point percentage of seven of 725. So quite good right now. The only teams above us are Florida and Cal- and Carolina, not the two teams I'd expect to be there. But, I mean, when the Calgary Flames, it's been a long time since they've been number one in the league. I mean, they've been number one in the West a few times, but I can't remember the last time they were number one in the NHL. Yeah, it was pretty much that uh, season that they were got neck and neck with Tampa for a bit uh, when they were first overall but uh, in the West. But, yeah, it's remarkable and uh the last time the flames finished with exactly 29 points after 20 games was the 88 89 season it was so that hopefully is good fortune <laughs> they've had more than that a few times but the fact that we're maybe mirroring that one maybe that's a maybe that's a good thing for us yeah and you have to think that like it frankly if the flames did not have defensive lapses to the extent that they've had in overtime that like they could easily have 33 or 34 points right now. Yeah. And, and it's, yeah. I mean, there, again, there's always something you can critique for any team, right? Oh yeah, for sure. And like the fact that they have three regulation losses after 20 games kind of shows that, yeah, this team's doing pretty much everything correctly. And, it, like it you're really just grasping at straws for anything to hang your hat on to say oh this isn't great the it's three like, regulation losses to me at american thanksgiving is the most impressive part usually this team's in a funk until about now yeah it's like we're praying for the seven game winning streak in december to salvage the season at this point and Usually that comes, mind you, but... It, well, and even that seven-game streak just kind of gets us back over that sort of wild card line. Yeah, exactly. Hey, we're not dead yet. <laughs> exactly. It sort of gives us that, okay, we came up, we stuck our head up, we took a deep breath, and then we're going to go back into it. So Yeah, everything's zeroed now. Let's go. <laughs> that, that's pretty much where we get to, isn't it? Yeah, and now like we have a buffer on everybody else, and... You know, so frankly, a large buffer on the playoffs. So, Matt, at this point, I mean, we're 20 games in for the Flames now. Is this team a good team? Is this team a very good team? Or is this team just a team that's been off to a hard start? How do you feel about the Flames this year? Well, we even mentioned this, like, in our season preview thing. And, like, frankly, for, like, the longest time, like, I've overestimated. um, Ever since I've known you. Well, pretty much, but it, like it, it was me looking at just like the raw talent that was in the organization at the time and feeling, well, if they're playing to their talent level, they should do X. And like that one year, they got 107 points. That was about right for where talent wise this team was. But for like the last number of years they've been kind of waffling because of the fact that they weren't really getting good coaching and like it it was a drama fest for a while but daryl's reset the team they have them pulling in all in the same direction and the talent level's still there and you know like this team is a good team and it always has been it's just that they haven't been on the same page and you can't win with any team if you're not having everybody pulling in the right way. And so like, yeah, I think this team is one of the elite teams in the NHL and you know, it's just a matter of this team carrying on and, and you think they can do that easily. I think you're right. We've talked, and not just this season preview, but for so many seasons, that on paper this team looked good. And I would say that this team to me is maybe not the strongest on paper team that we've seen. I mean, you and I have talked about some of the issues that we have, especially with the forward core on this team. But I think that, as you mentioned earlier, everybody knows their role, whether it's Monaghan well, and knowing his yeah, role on the well, third plus line. Plus it's like intangibles. Like, look at the defenseman, for example. Uh, like... If you look intrinsically at, like, Good Branson and Zadorov's skill level, like, there's not much difference between either of them and a bunch of the other guys that 
we've had as like five, six guys over the years. The difference is, is that they're both huge. And even though like that doesn't make a huge difference, it is a big deal. And because you're forcing the other team to realize that no matter what end of the rink I try to enter, you know, there's a good chance I'm going to get smushed into the boards. And it makes up for a little bit of hesitancy. And that little bit of hesitancy is enough to interrupt their game. And, like, it doesn't surprise me that that pairing has been really good on the advanced stats. And even though both of them are playing over their heads a bit. It's you, just you're the, forgetting one important difference. We didn't have to give up a pick at the deadline for these guys. True. And, you know, we could just... Well, we did use a pick for Zadorov, but, you know, that... But we also, get a full season out of it. True. It's a better, I would say, a better investment that way. True. And, like, the intangibles of, like, getting guys like uh, Trevor Lewis and Brad Richardson, like, even though, like, not the sexiest names on the UFA sheet, they both know what they're doing. They know how to play the game. They've done it. They've won a cup. They've been all the way. They go out, they do their job responsibly. They're not flashy. They're just good workers. And you sometimes, like, especially, like, last year, like, the carousel of guys like Josh Levo and that, like, those guys do not play good defensively. And it left the team open to a lot of stupid mistakes, which well, ended up that, in pucks in that. I think that's a big difference maybe in the makeup of this team than last year or other years. Last year it seemed like we were just trying to bring in NHL guys. This year it felt like we had... I mean, back in the day, what we'd call a Daryl Sutter player, that Western Canadian-style player, we knew who we wanted. We weren't trying to say, you've played in the NHL, you're cheap, therefore you're on our team. Yeah. Was, who's big, who's nasty, who's going to fit what Daryl wants? Yeah, we got our Chris Simons, our Sean Donovans, our uh, Billy Niemannins, you know, the, the plugger guys that do their job well and, you know, with reckless abandon and... Like, this team, for the longest time, hasn't had good, quote-unquote, fourth-line players. Like, in, it, until you go back to, like, when Garnett Hathaway, like, he was the last good fourth-line player that this team had. And, you know... I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it depends where class find good. I would say Toby Reeder, since him, was good for a fourth-line player. Yeah, I can agree with that. But, uh... Yes and no. Um... Like, there was not really a physical element to Reader's game. Like, he was a good defensive player, but... It... But I don't think we needed him to be that offensive guy at that point. Well, it, it was more, uh, like, the needing for physicality. And, uh, like, I think that, like, that's been a good portion of, like, why, the, like, the third and fourth lines have been successful thus far for the Flames this season is, like, you look at the Lucic goal, like, that was that whole line just, you know crashing and banging and it causes a turnover which led to Lucic scoring mm -hmm. and you know like that element of just raw physicality hasn't really been on this team since basically Daryl Sutter was the coach the last time and you know it, it's a huge thing even though like it doesn't show up necessarily in your advanced stats or anything like that when we talked about Monaghan earlier, I feel like everybody's buying into Daryl's system. Like There'd be a lot of teams where if your guy who's been your first-line center since he arrived is now playing on the third and fourth line, you'd be seeing rumors, you know, so-and-so wants out, so-and-so demands a trade. Like It just feels like everybody's sort of embracing... It's like they drunk Daryl's Kool-Aid, but it's like everyone sort of understands their role and is playing their role and realizes it's for the greater good. Yeah, and like, frankly... Like, if, say, like, you, you get an injury to a top six forward, you know Monaghan's going to slot right back up there. And, and is capable uh, of doing so. Yeah, and it it's good to have that versatility and, you know, share the wealth. And, you know, Monaghan's also learning, I think, for the first time in his career, how to be that intense physical defensive player. And, like, he has never really been, like, a passionate guy on the ice, but you're starting to see him throw his body around a bit, play that good defensive first style, and, like, actually get in and mix it up a bit. And, you know, in order for him to, 
reach his final development, I think, like, if he can merge that good defensive play with the offense, then, you know, because his offensive instincts are still there. Like, you can still see it, like, when he's on the power play. Like, it it, it hasn't just vanished. But it it's... Like, if he can become that more complete player, then you can rely on him being that second, third line center every game. And, like, up until now, like, he hasn't really been a complete player. And I think he's been able to get away with not being a complete player. I mean, everybody's got one or oh, two yeah. of those. But, but I also think that with the injuries we've seen from him lately and some of the, the challenges in his game and his wrist last year, I think this might almost be not necessarily to meet his potential, but the next evolution of his game. In order to stay relevant, he's going to have to be more of a two-way player because I don't know that he can do some of the same stuff offensively anymore. Yeah, and it's one of those that, like, if he can learn how to be that good two-way guy, like, he'll be an effective NHLer until, you know, like, he's 33, 34, 35. We don't know, like, to what extent even yet uh, how much his wrist has impacted him because, like, you know, frankly, every season he starts off slowly anyway. So, it, you know, like, it's only having two goals. Like, that really isn't far off of where he normally is after 20 games anyway. So, you know, we'll have to see especially like as the season goes on like perhaps like he builds enough confidence in Daryl that oh he can play on that second or third line instead of being on the fourth and you know getting more five on five offensive chances and 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 you know wins wins cure all right i mean it's not like he's playing on the third line with Richardson Lewis, he's playing with Dubé and Pitlick. Like, that's still, I would say, a good line. And I think yeah. that line, when I look at the team and I think of the role of each line, that line still has a place. So it's not like we've just cast Monaghan aside or, you know, we're just trying to piss him off to so leave. Like, I think he's he's still got a place, and I think he's he could be looked at to drive that line going forward once we sort of we, – we move guys in and out of that line and him up and down. But I think once the Flames can sort of decide who he's going to play with – I think you could look at him to drive a line, and I think you'll all almost see that. It's like a couple of years ago when we had the 3M line, and they weren't the most offensive line, but they were good at what they did. I think that you can sort of look at that second and third line as both being equal offensively. Yeah, and like especially like as we move closer and closer to the trade deadline, like if the Flames do decide to go and add, like it, say you get like a Philippe Forsberg or you know, insert miscellaneous guy of, like, a, a top six-ish forward, you could throw him on with Monaghan and Dubé, and instantly, like, you have a good first line and two good second lines, and, you know, have fun dealing with that, everybody. And, you know, when I when I look at this, uh, this team and where Monaghan fits into it, and like you were saying, him sort of maybe needing to learn the two-way game, it reminds me a lot of a young Michael Backlund. We didn't know what we had with this guy. We thought he might be more offensive. And I would say that Michael Backlund learned to be that defensive forward and has prolonged his usefulness on this team because of it. Oh, yeah. And Backlund, you know, he has been able to successfully merge both the offensive and defensive games to where he's an instrumental player on this team. Like, you know, he he and Goudreau, frankly, are two of the very most important players on this team. Like, I view him on, like, that upper tier because you do need that good second-line center, and he has been, you know, like, right there every year. And, you know, like, his offensive skills are not as good as some of the other players on the team, but his overall game is, like, right there. And the thing we have to remember with Monaghan, too, is while he's playing maybe bottom six minutes in 5-on-5, uh, five five, we're seeing him still playing on that first power play unit. So he's getting time out there with Kachuk and Goudreau, and I think that's what's really going to keep him going. Yeah, and, like, that's where, like I was saying, like, his offensive instincts haven't gone away. You know, like, if they did, then you wouldn't be putting him out there. And, like, if he gets the puck on his stick, like, he can score on the power play. It's just um, asking a slightly different thing from him. But, you know, he's been very effective on that power play unit. 
and well, the power play I think is fifth in the NHL or something like that, so it's doing fairly good anyway. And you know, it just it it's one of those things that with how successful the team has been, it kind of allows the ability to be patient with a guy like Monahan who is learning how to change his game and be effective in a completely different way. And, you know, if he can work through all of this and emerge on the other side as more of, like, the complete Michael Backlund-type guy, like, then, like, that's a huge, huge win for this team, not only for this season, but moving forward. I think going back to the earlier question I asked you of is this team sort of for real or is this team, um, you know, it, have we sort of seen them peak? I think that they're going to have to slow down. Like there's really no question that at some point this this pace is going to have to slow down. You're not going to keep winning and getting shut out to this pace. But I think this team can continue their great season. I would not be surprised if they end up first in the Pacific with the way they're playing, if not first in the West. Well, the thing is, is that like defensively, I'm not really seeing anything that the Flames are doing that isn't sustainable. Like the like every game, like when the opponent has the puck, there's always a Flames guy on him. Doesn't matter what end of the ice, where the guy is, there's always somebody buzzing him, and like that is the Flame system is to constantly buzz the opponent and get them to kind of, like, have to rush their thing until, you know, or make the play. And, you know, there's been nothing that shows any sign of that slowing down at any point. And that has been the constant right from the first game. And, you know, it forces the opponent to, like, on any play in order to actually generate a scoring chance or score a goal to beat you in several different plays just to set the thing up and then to score the goal. And, like, it makes the team very hard to play against. And so, like, the Flames being first overall in terms of goals against per game, uh, you know, like, that doesn't surprise me because the Flames are basically smothering every other team, and I don't really see that slowing down. And their offense has been good, and, you know, like, is Andre Mangiapane going to score at, like, the pace that he is? No. Like, I don't see him being a 50-goal scorer. <laughs> but and that's, and that's but why you're also some... but you're also seeing guys like Monaghan and Kachuk not scoring as much. And so, like, I, I could see, like, the Flames' offense being stable around what they're producing, but different people actually doing the scoring instead of, you know, like it being the Eat Bread show. Yeah, and, and that's, I guess, my big thing is I think that the big question is going to be can the Flames, can guys step in who maybe aren't contributing now to pick up for, for where some of these guys who are scoring aren't going to be able to keep that up? And I don't know that that's necessarily going to happen. I think there will be a dip where it won't. I think one of the issues this team still has is outside that top six, where does the scoring come from? Yeah, and like that's why like at the trade deadline, I could definitely see the Flames add a guy with some offensive talent or two uh, just to help boost a bit. You know, because like you can get away with like Coleman being on the second line with Backlund and Mangiapane, but you know, like. Pitlick is not good enough offensively to be playing with Monahan on the third line. Even though the effort level's there, he's a great fourth liner. But like, he really has no choice. Yeah, like there, there's just not enough offense there from that player. And, you know, whether you're bringing up a guy like Ruzitska or Peltier to put into that spot or you're acquiring a guy, like there needs to be more offense just in general from that spot. And Dubé needs to generate more offense himself, but, you know, I think that's just time and learning more than anything. And I, I don't think that... I mean, I wouldn't say that Markstrom's bailed us out of any games yet, but I don't think that he can continue to play the way he is. I, I think that he's... Like, ever since he's been with Vancouver, 
this is basically what you get out of Markstrom. Like, yeah, the numbers are better, but that's also just due to the fact that the Flames are smothering everybody before they get to Markstrom. You know, it, it's like the Flames are making them run the gauntlet from uh, American Gladiators, and then, oh, you have to deal with the six foot six goalie at the end. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's definitely doing a good job, and you don't really want him to have to do all the work. Um, but I, I just, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know. We didn't see all of Marsham last year, so I'm curious to see what we get out of him this year in a better season, a full season with him. Um, that, that'll be, to me, one of the biggest questions there. But I definitely think these guys can, can keep it up. I guess my big question for this team now, can they make it out of round one? Like, I think if you play it this way and you're the typical Calgary Flames one and done... I think it's even more of a disappointment because it's... Oh, like yeah. Just, well, just well, put it this way. Like, if you've done this consistently all season and, like, you don't reach the conference finals, it's an embarrassment. Like, frankly, um, just because of the fact that, like, this team, on top of, like, running roughshod over everybody in the regular season thus far, like, it's very much set up to be that relentless playoff team on top of it. And so, like, if you lose before really getting deep, deep into the postseason, it's kind of like, um, what happened? Yeah, no, you're right. And I think because our first round, based on where we'll be sitting, will be against another Pacific Division team, who I don't think are all going to be great this year. You should have a fairly easy first round, at least. Yeah, because basically, like, what I'm expecting, just in general, is either the Flames will face, like, um... Because, like, I'm assuming that, like, if the Flames stay above and win the division, Edmonton will play Vegas in the first round, just because those are the next two best teams, just in general. And then you're going to face, like, either Anaheim or one of the Pacific, or the Central teams, if Anaheim slows down and misses. Yeah, I, I don't know what to make of Anaheim this year. Like, I, I don't think San Jose is good enough, but I also don't think Anaheim is good enough. So it might no. end up being one of the central teams. Yeah, like I could see like the Flames playing Winnipeg or Nashville in the first round, or you know, one like one of that caliber of team, and which that's fine. And you know, the Flames should beat them. Mind you, they should have beat Dallas too. Well, frankly, if they had, had and mental they be focus, Colorado as well. Well, if they had mental focus in mm-hmm. the Dallas series, they win that series. They didn't, and they lost. So there's there's a lot of positives so far, and I think the big question and my big worry, honestly, at this point, Matt, is post all post All Star break or post Olympic break, can they keep it up? In the last couple of years, we've seen them really crap the bed after that after that uh, one week break. Yeah, well, that's where, um, like the Flames need to. And, and, like, to this point, they've shown that maturity. And, like, I think that, like, especially, like, when they get to that point, like, the you're going to need the Richardsons, the Luchichas, um, the Pitlicks, the guys that have been around a while and been around winning organizations at, to, you know, shoulder a bit of the load and say, no, this is how, you know, in order to be successful, this is how we need to play. And, you know, like Blake Coleman and get like Daryl, like all of those people reinforcing all the good parts and like, okay, let's keep it going. And yeah, we're facing some adversity. It's, you know, getting to the nitty gritty of the season. Let's go. And And, and I think also making sure those guys that you mentioned are ready to go because some of your Guys come back from China are going to be tired and jet lagged and that sort of thing. So making sure those guys are ready to take over some of that offensive and defensive load to sort of shoulder the the brunt of the work for a week or two. Yeah. By the way, quick question: Manjapane going to the Olympics? I think so. You need depth guys. You need guys that are used to playing seven to ten minutes a night. And I think Manjapane is one of those guys. I think you can easily have. Manjapani slot in on your third or fourth line in the Olympics, and you know what you're getting there for seven to ten minutes. Since so you start to bring these first line players on teams, and you put them there, and they just they don't know what to do for ten minutes. We've seen that in the past. Guys are used to playing thirty minutes a night, twenty minutes a night, fifteen minutes a night. Now playing seven, and it's like they just can't get their game going. Yeah, 
And, like, especially with how he breads a good penalty killer on top of it, I think that's a good complementary piece on Team Canada's roster. I don't think he's necessarily your star for Team Canada. Oh, no. I think, I think he's your fourth line guy. Yeah, third, fourth line. But I think so, too. So like that and, would and, be... I, and I think the fact that, you know, he's playing for a Canadian team, I think might help his chances as well. They always seem to like to bring guys who are playing in Canada for the, some of those depth roles. Uh-huh. I don't know. I mean, like you said, Manjapani, while we're talking about him, I don't think he can keep going at the pace that he's going. I don't think he's going to be a 50-point guy, but I think this is his year to really show us what he's got. Well, yeah, and like he's certainly uh, needing to get a few more assists, but, um, you know, the 15 goals, you know, you really can't complain with that. Um, like, you know, in our season preview, like I said, like, you know, for the outlandish prediction was that he'd score 30 and you know like I could easily see him hitting that but uh, you know um, whether or not like he's able to continue and hit 40 I don't know we'll see you know he still has 62 games so I think 30 is very reasonable with where he's at right now Uh I don't know I'm just kind of doing some math in my head I'm I'm not sure that we'll see much more than 30, maybe 35 if we're lucky. Yeah. That's just, yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing it. And I think especially looking at kind of where he's at in the lineup, I mean, he was playing on a line with Dubé and, Mon- and Monaghan. Dubé isn't really helping his cause there. Now he's playing with Backlund, who Backlund's good at moving the puck to him. I don't know, Coleman's the big help there. Like It seems like on both those lines, he sort of had one line mate to help the offensive numbers. Yeah, but you know, especially on the second power play unit, he's definitely becoming very adept at tipping pucks. So, and I think that's where the points will come if he's uh, if he's going to get more than thirty five. It's going to have to come on that power play. I just yeah, I can't see. I don't know. I don't know about you. I just can't see a lot more even strength minutes coming from or even strength goals coming from him with his line mates. Yep. I think he can definitely get some more points. I think he's going to be good for assists this year. I just don't know he's going to be the the goal leader for our team. Well, just some numbers here. Uh, Moneypuck.com, which you can go read about them. We've referenced them in the past on the show. Um, They've got some really interesting statistical analysis, and they're ranking the Flames right now. Percentage of making the playoffs, 91.8. Percentage of making the second round, 47.4. Making the third round twenty three point four and making the final ten point two, that's the highest of all the Western Conference teams. The next Western Conference team, oh no, Colorado's above them, um, but the next one under that is St. Louis. So Calgary definitely doing well this year. It's kind of weird to see Calgary's chance of winning the cup at four point four percent when you're the number one Western team and tied for three in the league. That seems like a, a low number. Well, there are thirty two teams, so you know that's true. It, it, but and when, it's but still early. At, but when we look at like Philly, Detroit, Chicago, Ottawa, Vancouver, Buffalo, Arizona, Montreal, they have no chance. Yeah. I guess I'm just looking it up here. They're saying that Montreal's an 0.2% chance. I would say Montreal's a minus 2% chance. Yeah. I mean, we've seen teams go like uh, St. Louis a couple years ago from the bottom, but they were not as bad as Montreal is. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's... Yeah. <laughs> it, we'll see. Like, uh, the... It's still very early, and I think that, like, some of the reticence on, like, that number being higher is just, like, is this team for real? And I think you're right, yep. Well, Matt, it's kind of weird, and you and I were talking about before we started recording tonight. It's late November. We're usually used to complain about how poorly this team's starting at this point and having a lot to talk about. Maybe so-and-so's not playing well, let's trade them. And I said to you before we started the big, sh- the big news this week, we're playing well like it's it's kind of weird we don't have the amount of news we normally would and the angry news talk about but it's sort of nice to just talk about the calgary flames playing good at playing hockey you know i don't mind when our shows are boring yeah at, at times you know because like oh gee the flames are kicking everybody's butt we're not here trying mm. to trade guys or talk about who our next coach should be or yeah like it, gee daryl's running the ship really well Everybody's pulling their weight in the right direction. We're leading the league in shutouts. 
both goalies are awesome. Everybody's doing great. Um, Eric, Eric Good Branson is serviceable. Yeah, like maybe we should re-sign him. You know, Oliver Shillington has replaced Mark Giordano's offensive abilities, which say what? Uh, <laughs> we, we we talked about that last week. I said, you know, when Gio left, we we didn't know if we'd be okay, and now okay's come to our rescue. Yep. And, you know, when you're talking after 20 games and the Flames have three regulation losses, yeah, I guess that's okay. And and not you just know. three regulation losses, but I would say three regulation losses impressive of 20, but three regulation losses with as many road games they've had, too. Yeah, true enough. Like, they've only played seven home games, I think. This team's been on the road so much so far. Yeah, like they're 3-1 and 3 at home and just demolishing everybody on the road, so... March and April. Well, March especially is going to be their big home month. Yeah, which makes sense. And, like, the Flames do have a very easy schedule um, to end the season in terms of both the caliber of opponents and um, just the fact that uh, we're at home most of the time. Um, Yeah, and, like, the regulation losses uh, was a back-to-back loss on the 9th and 11th, um, San Jose and Montreal, and the opening game of the season, every other time the Flames have lost, it's been in overtime. They've got at least won. a point like, for their troubles. You know, and like, gee, we've had a two-game losing streak. Woo. You know, like, yeah. like that's a lot to complain about, you know. <laughs> like, No, I, it's, a, it's a good – it's weird for us as, as, you know, Flames fans and Flames podcasters, but it's, it's, a, it's a weird place to be in, but it's a good place to be in. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's nice to see. And, like, you know, like, we can't even complain about the Stockton Heat, who have always been bad, because, like, I think they're first in their division. And they are, like, yeah. And it's like, um, yeah, so uh, it, it, is the ECHL team doing bad? That's uh, what I was just checking. How are the uh, – <laughs> but I, I don't even think that we have – we have Daniel Chechlev there. I think that's the only Flames prospect there, so we can't really complain if they're doing poorly. Yeah. Damn it, Chuchalev. <laughs> um, where is Kansas City is in their division, the Mountain Division. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight teams. They are third from the bottom. Yeah. So they're not doing great. But, again, not a lot of real Flames prospects down there. If I look at the list this year, um, I don't notice. I don't recognize any of the names there. There's a couple of guys there on AHL deals that are down there, but... Um, the only real Flames name is uh, Daniel Chechilev just because we had too many goaltenders. Yeah, and like if you're looking in the AHL, on, the Stockton Heat are the second best team in the entire league, uh, only behind uh, New Jersey's farm team, so the Utica Comets. Every other team is below the Stockton Heat, so it you know, and they're ten one and two. Yeah, so there's really nothing we can complain about. Maybe, maybe I haven't been to the Saldome as a fan yet this year. Maybe the uh, the beer prices have gone up. Someone can let us know on social media. You want and us can... to pay what for a beer? Like, jeez. <laughs> well, and it's not even good beer. I mean, it's always been like, you know, Budweiser and Canadian. So yeah. um, if, if you want that, I'll, I'll take your glass. I'll go in the men's room. I'll give you something that'll taste the same, and I'll charge you half price for it. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's there's really nothing we can we can complain about. I'm just looking at the roster here. Well, of, like uh, Dustin Wolf in Stockton, like he's six zero and two with a nine thirty one save percentage. You know, like it's like um, okay. <laughs> there's like, one, like, two, three, four, five, six, seven Heat contracts in Kansas, but no Flames contracts. Um, Chechilev's, I guess, the only guy that we would really care about there. I know it, it's just weird like as a flames fan that like hey our guys are just kicking everybody's butt and and it's at the juniors level and the nhl level you know it's it almost matter. like that one time in your organization's history where everything's aligning like the nhl team's good the ahl team's good the junior teams are doing pretty well well, like, uh, it actually happened in baseball this year where uh, the Tampa Bay Rays, they were first, their AAA team was first, their AA team was first, their A-ball team was first. And it's like, um, okay, yeah, okay, you guys are good. 
Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> I've always tried, when the few times I've played like Eastside Hockey Manager and stuff like that, I always try to get the NHL team, the AHL team, and the ECHL team to win every year. But it's tough because you know, if you're a good NHL team, you don't have deep. Uh, you don't have a deep farm team. No, ge- not generally, anyway. And I think you could even argue that Calgary doesn't have a really great farm team. I think, like the Flames, we're getting good production from the top guys, and everyone else is playing their role. Well, like even um, some of the Flames' depth picks have really turned out to be decent players, like Rujitska. So you know, and like even our first round pick from this past season. Uh, he has uh, Matthew Coronado has ten points in eight games, which for the NCAA, like that's actually really exceptional for a freshman. So, it, you know, like everybody is basically doing great for where they're at, and it's like, um, knock which, on wood. Let's what, not jinx where it. am I? Which team are we talking about? Let's not jinx it. Yeah. Feels so, we that don't, way. so we don't jinx it. Let's get out of here before we keep talking about it. And, you know, someone's now going to hurt themselves tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, the Flames have three days off. Today is Wednesday when we record. They're off today, tomorrow, and Friday. They will play Hockey Night in Canada, the 8 p.m. game against Winnipeg in the Saddle Dome on Saturday. And then they have Sunday off, and they'll play the Pittsburgh Penguins in the Saddle Dome Monday night, a 7 p.m. start time. And those yeah, are the most- it's like, hey, we have a day off. What? <laughs> what is well, this and, foreign concept? And, you know, I kind of like, I mean, we've seen times in the past where they've been on the road with three days off, and I think I would hate that as a player. Like, you're just sitting around your hotel. If you're going to have days off, let's get them back here. Let's get them in their own beds. Like, I think the, as much as we've been on the road, I think the schedule's been laid out pretty well so far. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, before the season started, actually, for efficiency and, like, quality of competition, the Flames actually have the easiest schedule in the league. So it, it's been quite beneficial thus far. Like, there's not been any, like, stupid going to the East Coast for three games, coming back, and then going back to the East Coast like and we there, saw a couple years ago. And there really isn't. I mean, I'm looking at the whole schedule here. There's really none of those this year, which I think is really going to help as well. Yeah. I think the, like, I'm just looking ahead here. Every trip sort of seems to be, I'll call it a divisional trip. Um I think the worst one is probably Nashville to Minnesota and then Minnesota Winnipeg within four days. It's probably the worst trip they have to do right at the end of the year. And maybe um, Tampa Bay to Carolina or Columbus, St. Louis back to back. Yeah. Like even that, like, isn't that bad or Dallas, Arizona, like none of those are like particularly egregious. Like we don't have the weird trip this year where they're in like, Winnipeg one night, then Tampa Bay the next night, then San Jose two nights later. Yeah, like none of that weird bizarreness. And like even like if you're looking in April, like they go to L.A., then they stay there and play in Anaheim, then they move north to uh, San Jose, then they move north to Seattle, and then they're home again. Well, even next month they do that. Second, third, fourth, and th- or fifth and seventh of next month. They start in L.A., then they Anaheim night next night. Then they go to. It's kind of weird that they would leave and then come back to California, but it's L.A., Anaheim, Vegas, San Jose. Well, uh, actually, Vegas is closer to L.A. than San Jose, so uh, you know it's yeah, it's in the next state, but it's actually closer. So and then it kind of next... still follows that general trajectory. And then their next trip that month is a back-to-back Chicago, Nashville, which is not hard, and then they've got a Seattle, Winnipeg back-to-back, which is one here. And one in Seattle, so that's going to be an easy trip. Yeah, like that's like when we play in Vancouver and back. It's like okay, yeah, sure, whatever. So I mean, I'm I'm happy with the way the road schedule's set up now. Yeah, like it's there's not really any stupid road trips, like where it's just you're bouncing all over the place for no reason, and then like for three games, and then you're back, and then you're right back out again. Yeah, and we don't have those. We've seen it in the past where it was like, what, four or five games on the road, then they come back for one, and then they're out for three again? Yeah, and it's like, uh, well, why didn't you just stay on the road then? Yeah. It was almost like they just needed to bring us back here to go to the other side of the country. Yeah. Well, like uh, I'm very much looking forward to March where they're playing like uh, 11 games in March in the Saddle Dome. Uh, and like especially like – at assuming like the playoffs are looking more and more likely as we're getting through the season like those games will be a lot of fun 
and you know like the just the protracted homestands uh throughout that month i think will help this team a lot of games a lot of excitement it'll be a it'll be a good month yeah but before we get to march let's uh say goodbye to november with our predictions for these games these uh games we didn't do well last week last week i predicted we'd win new york and chicago lose buffalo and boston our guest host, Kevin, thought we'd win Buffalo, Chicago and lose the other two. And Mike got the closest. He thought we'd win New York, Boston, Chicago, but nobody expected we'd win all four. Yeah. What are you thinking for this week, Matt? Well, you see, earlier in the season, I went against myself and w- I would have predicted a f- sweep. Didn't get the points because I changed my mind. Last week, I probably would have p- predicted a sweep just because. And nope. But uh, this time, I'll say that we will win both games. I'm going to say we win Winnipeg, and we will get one point against Pittsburgh. Uh, I still think that Pittsburgh, uh, being without Malkin, uh, they will be uh, by the time that game rolls around. Like, that'll be hard for them to be able to... Like, because Pittsburgh's not doing very good this season. Like, they're... Well, they're sort of like Edmonton, though, right? If you lose your top two players, you don't have much there. Yeah, and like they're they have twenty two points in nineteen games, which isn't bad, but it's not great. And they're very much a middle of the pack team, and very much like Winnipeg, who also has twenty two points in nineteen games. Like they're just average ish, and like I think Calgary can handle them both. Why don't you get us out of here, Matt? Well, as always, go Flames, go, and you know, keep kicking some butt. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.